Well, I was born um, uh, actually on a riverboat in St. Paul uh, that my grandma lived on, on, on the Mississippi, so that's where I was born. Graduated from high school in White Bear in 1942 and then entered the Army Air Force in uh, November of 1942. I was born in Ortonville, Minnesota. It's on the border with South Dakota, straight west of here. I was born on November uh, 14th, 1925. I'm 87 years old. I had a twin sister, and my dad had a meat market, and uh, he came up to the hospital, and when he went back to the market, he got a phone call, we got another one up here. The day the bombs dropped on Pearl Harbor, I just turned 16, and I was out northeast of my hometown of Ortonville hunting jackrabbits. I had to quit my senior year of high school. I never graduated from high school. I went to work in his meat market. I was 70, 80 hours a week, I was carrying quarters of beef and butchering cows and scalding hogs. I could hardly wait to get in the war. Way back when I was a kid, I decided that uh, I wanted to fly, but I knew that there was no chance because it was too costly because I grew up in the Depression and uh, we were very, very poor. And so, uh, uh, when the war came along, I thought, boy, here's my chance. I'm going to go in the Air Force. Finally, I enlisted, and I wanted to be a fighter pilot. Every kid in America, I think, wanted to be a fighter pilot. You, you took a test, and, and that test classified you as bombardier, navigator, or pilot. Those were the, those were the officers on, on the bomber crew, and um, they, they classified you as scores of one to nine, I was fortunate enough to get a nine on all three of them. So they did let me pick. I flunked the physical. When I was a kid, I was climbing a tree and collecting eggs out of bird's nests and I, I fell and broke this arm. I had a compound fracture. I can't lay this hand flat. And I, the doctor says, we'll offer you limited service. You can drive a truck or you can uh, type. And I said, I want to be a fighter pilot. But I'm sorry, soldier, it has to go on your record. My basic training was in, in, in uh, Keesler Field, Bloxy, Mississippi. And you come to the parade grounds from all over America, soldiers, just kids. The kid from Texas was mean looking, tall, and the kid from Boston couldn't speak the language. It was a bottle with a metal cap, it was a bottle with a metal cap. The kid from Arkansas had. His brogue was so, you couldn't understand it. And the farm boy from Kalaskanine, Oregon had buck teeth, he was a strange looking kid. And all of a sudden, the, the sergeant yells, tench, hut, and we're, we're at attention. We no longer focus on each other. It's not, we're doing push-ups and sit-ups. And the kid from Texas helped me carry my backpack when I could hardly stand. And, and the kid from Kalaskanine, Oregon was standing, trying to figure out why he's to take him down. And now we were buddies. We're no longer looking at each other because kind of freaks. We were together, and that was the purpose of basic training, to shape us up and ship us out. Well, one day my buddy, his name was Bud Riley, came to me, and he was dangling a $20 bill. And he says, Parker, we're rich. His mother had tucked it in the folds of a letter. And she began to write twice a week, and she there was always a 20. And Parker, we're wealthy. We'd go to town and, and we would ride horseback and we'd go to the gambling shows. And we even went to a girly show. The next phase of our training was down in, in, in Tennessee. Uh, we got together as a, as a crew. So we learned how to drop bombs out of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we, we simulated bomb drops. And, one day uh, over Dyersburg, Tennessee, I was firing my machine guns at some gas cans that were on a barge. And it was fun watching them explode, and I made a mistake. When you fire a machine gun, you fire it in bursts. Brr, brr. If you hold it too long, it'll heat up the breech, and the shell will explode. Well, that's what happened to me in my excitement. I forgot that rule, and uh, they had to take me and give me a, a tetanus shot when we landed. And uh, I couldn't get the Purple Heart for that. That's how I learned to 
shoot machine guns, and I eventually ended up as a tail gunner in, in a B-17. I got my commission in February of 44, and before the end of the month, I joined my crew, the other nine members of my crew in Sioux City, Iowa. Now, that's the first time I'd ever been in a B-17. I first stepped in a B-17 in Las Vegas, Nevada, gunnery school. It was quite a ride. Oh, that, that was uh, something, you know, we went down the runway, and I'm wondering, are we going to get off before the end of the runway? And, uh, you know, we lifted off a long time before we got to the end. And then it, it seemed like um, he adapted very f rapidly to, to that airplane because you, you knew you were going to be in it for a while. Now, there's a plane right behind me, uh, and that was a model I trained in it. But the one I flew in was a little more modern than that one. That was a miracle then, you know, that was, uh, the IT at that time was fabulous for that time. All the stuff in there was just amazing. I'm thinking uh, this airplane costs a quarter of a million dollars. <laughs> that was a lot of money in 1944. And I'm thinking, boy, I got to be on the ball here and do a good job getting us to the target and back. When we were loaded for takeoff in combat, we had 10 crew members, thousands of rounds of ammunition, 12 500-pound bombs, and, and all our weight was double from, from, and it would start down the runway, oh, on and on and on, and that plane was just as reluctant to take off as we were. You just think, well, this, this is the greatest time in my life to be flying in an airplane like this. And it was uh, such a powerful craft. You know, I'd flown in, in single engine planes, and then to get into that four engine and listen to those engines ref up, 4,800 horsepower. I started flying my combat missions 10 days after D-Day. June 16th, 1944, and finished 50 missions on September 12th, 1944. You got the Colonel's wingman, smoking on number four. On uh, November 18th, uh, 1944, we bombed Vienna. We we're just coming off the target. We're over Yugoslavia. We're letting down so that we could get off oxygen. Well, just about the time I was going to get off oxygen, I heard, get out, get out. And I turned, and here was a B-17 to my right, upside down, in a flat spin. And several parachutes were coming out. And the plane exploded. First mission was to Wiener Neustadt. It, it's a suburb of uh, Vienna, Austria. And there was a big oil uh, refinery there. And, and we went to that, and I remember... Uh, some of the guys had told me that had flown missions, what it'd be like. And I remember seeing the flak, those big black puffs, uh, about 100 miles before we got to the target. And I got on the intercom and said, what, what's that? And the pilot said, uh, the guy that had experience, he said, that's what you call flak. And the closer we got to the target, the more intense the flak became always over the target, flak was exploding. Flak took down more aircraft in World War II than fighters. It was uh, terrible stuff. It always hit the aircraft. Jeez, as we got closer to the target, you could walk on it, but they just put a barrage of flak up in the whole area. And I thought, ooh, yeah, yeah, this is really something. Uh, one of the things on a mission is that about somewhere between 6 and 20 minutes before you drop the bombs, you get to what's called the IP, the initial point. That's where you open the bomb bay doors and the airplane flies straight and level. You don't make any uh, evasive action. The German fighters disappear. They don't want to be in the flak, but the flak is very heavy over the target. They just saturated the area. They, they necessarily weren't aiming at any airplane, but they knew the height we were flying. And the way they picked that up is the contrails. And they knew our altitude, our airspeed, and they set the fuses on their exploding shells to be right where we were gonna to be to drop the bombs. We were over the target, and uh, you know how B-17 is built? It has that astrodome. And I was standing up looking at that, out of that, because the 
the, the fire was just horrendous. They flack and a piece of flack came through and hit my steel helmet and made a dent in it as big as my fist, but did not uh, break through, knocked me down. When I got back, the colonel, the commanding officer of the group, a asked me, he said, Lieutenant, what did you think of this first mission? And I said, Colonel, I can tell you, I'd make a better lover than fighter. One day, we bombed a target in northern Italy called Padua. We came off the target, and we were in such bad shape the two engines in the middle of the B-17 were just gone, feathered. The outboard engines were running three-quarter power because their controls were shot out. The pilot was struggling with that aircraft to try to get back to base. Fortunately, we were south of the Alps and we were pretty close to our base. The engineer called the crew and said, get in crash position, we may not have a good landing. So we all went to the radio room, except for those that were needed to fly the aircraft and the engineer, and got in spoon-style position. The pilot lost control of his aircraft, and we drifted into a whole bunch of C-47s, a, a twin-engine aircraft, kind of the jeep of the sky. We crashed into the first one. It turned us into the other one, cut it in two. Unfortunately, a guy was killed there. We crashed into all the rest of them, and uh, several were killed on the ground, and several in my plane were in, in critical condition. I visited them in the hospital later. But, my pilot destroyed more friendly multiple engine aircraft in World War II than anybody. He was an ace. He destroyed four C-47s and a B-17. Okay, here they are. Nine o'clock high, enemy fighters. Whenever you're flying over enemy territory and you're being shot at and attacked by fighters, uh, the engineer, I mean the navigator, on our crew would call for oxygen check. Starting at the tail, we would all report in to make sure everybody was okay. What I would do is I would wiggle out of the tail, past my ammunition boxes. I was the only one with his own escape hatch. And I would sit there and I'd have my parachute on one link and I had body armor on and I had the 23rd Psalm and my <laughs> reciting that from time to time. I would substitute fear with fantasy. I would look around my ammunition boxes and my oxygen hose went to a blinker. I could see every breath that I took. It was like a pair of lips. I would fancy that that was my girlfriend back home kissing me. <laughs> it would replace some of the other problems, see? Well, one day when he called for oxygen check, the radio man didn't answer. We went around again and one of the waste gunners didn't answer. So the pilot called me, he said, Parker, what's happening back there? Well, I could look through the, past the tail wheel, through the waist, into the radio room, and Faust, the radio man, was out cold. The waste gunner was trying to get oxygen into him. His line had been severed, and you can only last two or three, four minutes, you know, without oxygen. So I yelled to Clancy, Faust is down, and Patchy's trying to get oxygen into him. Uh, he said, we're going down. The pilot put the aircraft in a power dive over Vienna. We went from 28 to 12,000 feet past the danger line, which on a B-17 is 275 miles an hour. Anything can happen after that. He could lose control, maybe an aileron, whatever. And we pulled out and we saved the, the radio man's life, but he was never the same after that. But an interesting thing happened. On the way down, he said, prepare to bail out. Well, I was always ready. There was crazy things happening. And he said, but don't bail out unless you hear the emergency bell. I found out after the war that the circuitry didn't reach the housing in the emergency bell in the tail. I never would have heard that. The guys would have waved goodbye. These are the strange things that, that happen from time to time. Probably one of the most interesting missions was um, in early August of 1944, I flew with the colonel in the lead ship of the fifth wing in Italy. That was six bomb groups, six B-17 bomb groups. And uh, the colonel had been an Olympic diver in 1936 Olympics, and he got to know Axis Sally. Well, we always listened to Axis Sally because she had all the good music, Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey and Jimmy Dorsey and Gene Krupa. 
Well, we were listening to Axis Sally, and because she knew Colonel Kurtz, she came on and she said, Frankie, we're gonna get you today. We know you're going to Budapest and we're waiting for you. And we're also waiting for that little pink-faced navigator from Minnesota. You know, I, I looked so young, I had, uh, I looked like a kid with pink face, you know. And they got a, a lot of information on us. They hired clipping services, local newspapers. The White Bear Press had a big write-up about me before I went overseas. Now, they didn't know where I was going because I didn't know, but they, they told a lot about me. Not say my country right or wrong. I love America, but I do not love Roosevelt and all of his kite boyfriends who have thrown us into this awful turmoil. Her, her propaganda was very useless. You know, she'd come on and say, you, you know, you guys ought to go back home and give up because your girlfriends or your wives are running around with guys at home. And, you know, it was, uh, it was so illogical. It, it didn't affect us, but we loved her music. And we joked around a lot under the dire circumstances. One day a shell exploded under the ball turret and, and he yelled up, has anybody got any uh, windshield wipers up there? There's juice flowing all over the ball. It was hydraulic fluid. We dropped back, we had lots of damage. The pilot called me. Parker, we may not have brakes and tires, and we need to rig a parachute in the tail. So he had me put a parachute in the tail. There's a little canopy in a B-17 and a little ledge. And all the way in on the landing pattern, uh, he talked to me. We were to use it as a brake. And, and, and uh, so finally, we were, we're on the landing. Don't need it, so I throw it down. I didn't know what was going to happen. We used up all the runway, no tires, no brakes. We ground looped in the grass and stopped. The plane was a mess. Clancy came back to me and he said, Parker, you did a good job. And I said, Clancy, I didn't do anything. He said, that's what I mean. <laughs> and uh, you know that the number of planes was just massive. Uh, the fi I was in the 15th Air Force based in Italy. We'd put up five or 600, but the 8th Air Force out of England would put up a thousand. That's bombers without the fighter planes. So it was a massive operation. We just had so much equipment. You fly a mission and five or six or seven planes get shot down. There's replacements right there. We had extra engines, extra parts. Uh, uh, just We just had everything, plenty of gasoline. Uh, the only thing that we didn't have was uh, good food. One day we took off for a place called Hagen's home. The ship began to shake, like a dog out, just shaking by, I don't know what's going on, I'm just the tail gunner back there. The pilot says, prepare to bail out. Well, you know, I was ready for that all the Finally, uh, he called the navigator and he said, we can't get back, find me a place to land. We landed in a pasture in Yugoslavia. And we rolled to a stop, we all jumped out, but we were in enemy territory. And one kid was on a bicycle, and he was maybe 12, 13 years old. He had a machine gun across his back, and he threw down the bicycle, and he ran up to my engineer, and he grabbed him, and he said, cigarette, Joel? <laughs> Cigarettes were the coin of the round. Well, there we were in enemy territory. So the radio man radioed for help, and a C-47 came in, that, that twin engine, a door flew open, and here's a beautiful nurse and a doctor, and 10 guys are rushing her, she's mine. <laughs> we pile in, we go back over the Adriatic and land on our base, came into my tent, six of us lived in the tent over there in Italy, and the waste gunner wasn't with us that day. We had bumped him for a photographer, and he was crying. He'd heard that, that he'd lost his crew, and here we were. The Air Force didn't do the whole job. The men on the ground, the men on air, on ships, everybody did a great job. And we all worked together. It was a very cooperative effort. Italy 
July 6th in 1945. I landed in the United States at Bangor Field, Maine, July 12th. I jumped out of that bomber and I got down and I kissed America. I think the best part of my experiences in World War II was the fact that it changed me drastically. I, I left home as a, a kid and came back and now my dad, I wasn't his little boy anymore. And uh, he wanted to know where I'd been the last couple of years. I think my dad again made the comment that fit. He said you left home as a boy and you came back as a man. During that short period of time in combat, you begin to look at the world far differently, yeah, much more mature. You know, you, you, you walked on the street before that and you met people and you said hello to them. Now you're in an airplane where you got guys on the ground shooting at you and fighter planes coming at you trying to kill you and you're trying to kill them. It makes your mind change in such a hurry that, that it, it's, it's very unusual. I don't think usually in life we can change that rapidly. All of us were just little bits of history. We really uh, were inside of history, didn't really rise, we were making history. And, and now it certainly will be history. I, I'm with them all the time, so I really, they haven't left me. And the older you get, the closer you get to these things. You know, you come home from the war, you put it behind you, and you get married and you, and you have kids and, and you get a job and you do it in that order, it's crazy it seems. And, and uh, then finally, what happens? is you grow up in a free country, a little bit of your own making. It's, it's, it's hard to explain how close we were. They're all gone now. I'm the only one. My best friend, Bud Riley, he was in basic training with me. He was at gunnery school with me. Now Bud and his brother-in-law were in the same aircraft, which was a kind of a taboo, you know, and when the Sullivan boys went down there. So, go on. Over Linz, Austria, February 25th, Bud's plane got hit. And it dropped down to about 2,000 feet and there was a terrible fire and exploded. Bud was killed. His brother-in-law survived. Whenever I put out the flag on special days, I look up and I see Bud and he's dangling the $20 bill at me. He says, Parker, we're rich. And I always have to say, yes, we are rich. And because of all the Bud Rileys, down through the ages, we're free. It's still the same old story. The eighth gets all the glory. The fifteenth has to die. <laughs> you must remember this, that bullets don't always miss. Somebody has to die. The odds are always too damned high when those fighters go by. Now one tens and two tens knocking at your gate. Come on, aerial gunner, shoot down a certain rate. Come on, bombardier, salvo, don't be late. The target's passing by. It's still the same old story. The eighth gets all the glory. The fifteenth has to die. 